Michelle, and I'm the City Kids Director here at City Church. We care about your kids, and we want to invest in them even when they can't be in the City Kids class. So each week, we post a video lesson on the City Kids page on the website, along with some activities that you can do with them throughout the week. So go check it out. What's up, guys? Welcome to City Church Online. My name is Maddie. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're a first-time guest, we would love for you to take a minute and fill out our digital connect card, available either in the chat on the online platform, or you can text NEW to the number below, and we will donate $5 in your honor to a feeding center that we help to support in the Philippines. This helps us get to know you a little bit better and answer any questions that you may have. You can also feel free to reach out to us on either of our social media platforms, Facebook or Instagram. We want to also take a minute to say thank you so much to everybody that gives at City Church. Because of your radical generosity, we get to do what we do here and we are so grateful. If you would like to be a part of what God is doing financially through City Church, you can click the link in the chat on the online platform or you can text GIVE to the number below. Remember, you are not just giving to a church, you are giving through a church. Some quick updates for you guys. At City Church, we believe that prayer is our first response, not our last resort. So if you or anybody that you may know of needs prayer, our pastors and our staff will be honored to pray for you. So you can click the link in the chat on the online platform, or you can text prayer to the number below. We also have Growth Track available right now. This is our Next Steps class where you can learn a little bit more about who we are, what we're all about, how to get plugged in. So if you're interested in learning more, you can click the link in the chat on the online platform, or you can text GROW to the number below and we'll get you more information on that. We also have city groups continuing to meet throughout the week. We have groups on Sundays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So we would love to get you connected and keep you encouraged in this season in that way. We have groups right now meeting in person and we also have an online option available. So please let us know in the chat on the online platform or you can text group to the number below. Lastly, we continue to be a church that is in the city and for the city, so please feel free to reach out with any needs, ideas, or opportunities that you may know of so we can serve our city well together during this time. Thank you so much again for being here. Enjoy the service. Praise the Lord, His mercy is born. Stronger than dark. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Hey, welcome to City Church. Come on, sing with us. What love? What love could remember? No wrongs we have. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sign. Thrown into a sea. Without bottom or shore, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins. would wait as we constantly wait. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Of kindness he lavished on us, 
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood near the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. So much more, praise the Lord, His mercy is more. This next song talks about how the Spirit of God is living. He is active, He's alive, He's vibrant. No matter what we're going through, all our fears, if we'll put them on Him, He's the only one that can really take them all the way. Would you sing with us? Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice.
Hey guys, welcome to City Church Online. So glad you're tuning in with us. Listen, no matter where you're tuning in, you are loved, safe, and welcome in this community, and we're so glad that you're here. Hey, if you're on our Church Online platform, if you're on Facebook Live, we'd love to hear from you. You can use the chat, engage with us, let us know where you're watching from and uh, what you had for breakfast. We'd love to hear from you. It's always an honor to gather with you in whatever kind of community we can in this season. Remember, we're the church no matter where we are, whether we're on a couch, in a driveway, on a park bench, or together in community, we are the church, and so it's an honor to have you here. Hey, in addition, super excited to announce a few things coming up as we're engaging together, and so let me just let you know what's going on here at City Church over the next couple of weeks. We have next Sunday a 21-day prayer and fasting happening together in community, and we want to invite you into it. And so it'll, it'll kick off next Sunday, so we want to give you a little bit of heads up and time. We're going to use this 21-day devotional uh, called Pursuit. You can find this on uh, Amazon, hard copy. You can purchase it and order it yourself. It's written by Dave Patterson. Um, also, if you'd like a digital PDF copy, you can use the connection cards, the digital connection cards or the numbers on the screen. Let us know, and we would love to get you the, that digital copy and, and give you the information necessary to be able to engage with us over this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Also, more instruction is going to be coming out on, on uh, what we're fasting from and how to fast. And, and so if you're new to that or you want to give it a shot for the first time or you just need a little more instructions, you can let us know through that connection card. And we would love to send that information to you as we engage in uh, prayer and fasting. Now, what's really cool is these are lining up with three consecutive weeks of nights of worship and prayer outside. And so it's been a minute since we've been allowed to get together due to COVID, um, but because we have a space outdoors that we're renovating and, and making available to community, we're able to gather in safe ways. It's socially distanced, following all the guidelines. And so outdoors, starting next Sunday at 7 p.m., we're going to have three consecutive weeks of nights of worship worship and prayer, and we want you to be there. It's going to be so awesome because we believe that when we seek God in prayer, we experience him in power. And so uh, this is kind of like that secondary outlet. You know what? We can't gather in a building on Sunday mornings right now, but we can gather in the evenings together to pray and worship together. And so you're invited. Your friends are invited. Your neighbors are invited. If you're a guest with us and you haven't connected in live community with City Church at this point, we would love to meet you in this space. And so it's going to be a lot of fun, really engaging, starting at 7 p.m. Kids are invited. It's outdoors right next to our playground so the kids can run around and have a great time while we engage in worship and our team leads us in prayer. And so I would love to see you there and our team would love to meet you. In addition, a couple of updates coming up. We have uh, city groups that meet in homes throughout the week and it's a really helpful way to stay connected in community in smaller groups of 8 to 10. And we say often here at City Church that circles are better than rows when it comes to uh, relationships. And so our summer semester is just now ending, and then it's going to kick back off at the beginning of September. And so we would love to connect you in city groups on a weekly basis. When they kick off in September, they're going to be a really helpful way to connect and stay connected in community, to grow together, to be encouraged. And it's one of the ways that we continually serve our city together. And so if you're interested in connecting to a group that's kicking off in September, you can use your connection card or the numbers on the screen, and we would love to connect you in that way. Now, a couple of things as we get into it. We've been in this series out of the book of Colossians, and it's been really, really helpful as we're having conversations, just walking through this book. We, man, it's, it's 
it's covered a lot of ground. And so this week, we're kind of uh, talking about relationships in, in, the, in the realm of, of marriage. And, and so last week, we looked at relationships in general, and now we're looking at the relationships between uh, um, uh, spouses. And, and it's really, really helpful because it's, it's only two verses. Now, before I get into the verses, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context in the conversation that we're having today. I'm not going to lie. As I was preparing this, uh, I did everything I could to hand this message off. Like, I was looking for videos to play. I was looking for someone to speak for me. Like, uh, I was really heavy on my heart to, uh, to communicate this message, and I wanted it to be helpful. And, and, you know, to be honest, I don't know how you feel, but, but man, there's just times where I, I don't feel adequate um, to speak directly into certain areas because, because I feel like it's an arena that I'm always growing in. But then, you know, if, if we're all honest, like that's probably area, every area of our lives. And so uh, we're going to walk through the text together. It's going to be helpful. But here, here's what I want to ask you as we get into the conversation. And, and here's the deal. If, if you're not married, uh, if you're single, or if you're uh, um, uh, divorced, or, or if you're widowed, or no, no matter where you find yourself on the spectrum of relationships, um, this conversation is going to be helpful because it deals with the bigger picture of, con uh, of conflict. Um, but Paul's going to be speaking specifically to husbands and wives. And, and here's what I want to ask you. Um, have you ever found yourself in, in conflict or, or dealing with an issue, and all of a sudden, the original issue, whatever it was, like you're arguing about it, and in the back of your mind, you're like, why are we arguing about this? And you think about it, you're like, this is not even important. Like, wh how do we get here? And all of a sudden, it's escalating, and you're like, what are we? What are we so upset about? And, and all of a sudden, whatever the issue is, is no longer the issue. And so have you ever wondered, like, what, what's, what's the issue underlying the issue that started the issue? Like, what's, what's the circle here? What's going on? Have you ever found yourself in that moment? I, I think there's some helpful things we're going to be able to look at, and there's some things that we're, we're, we're wrestling through. There's some underlying issues that, that we're going to be able to look at, and and. I would propose that there's two words that we can lean into today, and that's, that's issues around love and respect. And there's a guy named uh, Emerson Egrich, and he wrote a book um, called Love and Respect. And um, I, I'm not a doctor. I, I'm not, you know, the guy that educates you on all this stuff. But I highly recommend, if you're interested, uh, pick up this book. It's really, really helpful, Love and Respect by Emerson Egrich. And he, he, he argues that there's two fundamental issues of every uh, uh, conflict and relationship, and it's issues of love and respect. And he, and he introduces the idea of a crazy cycle, that, that when I feel disrespected, I'm unloving. And when uh, she feels unloved, I'm disrespected. And let me say this. Men and women mutually both need love and respect. It's not like one or the other. But there have been uh, statistics and, and lots of studies that have shown that, that there's a proclivity for men to need respect more than love, and there's a proclivity for women to need love more than respect. Not, not that you don't need both, but rather there is a higher need, a higher felt need, if you will, um, on, on average, okay? This is not 100% across the board, but in most cases, studies have shown that this seems to be the case. And so this crazy cycle is, is what I think we get stuck in. And, and so no matter what the issue is, right, it could be that we ran out of cereal and you were supposed to go buy cereal and you forgot. And what could just be a simple conversation turns into this really big argument. You're like, how did it get here? Because it elevates to a love and respect issue. And so uh, um, I'm unloving and, and and then she's disrespectful, and because uh, she's disrespectful, I'm unloving, and because I'm unloving, she, right? And we, we do this circle over and over again, and the question is, how do we get out of it? How, how do we get out of the circle once you get into it? And, and can I be totally transparent with you? Um, um, this happened this morning. Danielle and I were having a conversation, and all of a sudden, it like, turned into something that it was never supposed to be, and we're both kind of a little heated, and I'm, and I'm like, what? Why are we arguing about, like, what, what happened? And in the moment, uh, um, I didn't realize it, and this is something that always happens, it seems, after the fact, but um, we started talking about it, and my body language was communicating to her that what she was telling me about, I didn't care about. So she felt unloved in the process of me sitting there, but you know, my eyebrows and my facial expressions uh, felt like I was being unloving and disengaged. And so, um, again... This, this is something that you probably deal with on a regular basis, and I'm going to encourage us how, how we can maybe flip the script, and instead of being in this crazy cycle, uh, find that there's mutual encouragement happening, and, and we can see some real progress in our relationships. And so let me give context to the text before we get into 
the actual text, and, and that is this. In the culture that Paul is writing to, Paul is writing to an early church, uh, the Church of Colossians, a little baby church, just like our church here at City Church. And as he's writing to them, he's also writing in a context that we might be unfamiliar with. And so in this cultural context, at this time, um, the, the dad would have been the domineering figure in the home. Okay, and so we live in the Western world. We live uh, in, in a modern era that, that looks at roles and, and, and gender and all kinds of things in a, in a very different way. But you have to understand the context that he was writing to at this moment. What was he was speaking to uh, men and, and and domineering husbands and and fathers who who treated their wives and children as property. Not just treated; they they literally were property, meaning that dad could do whatever he wanted. In fact, a home would be set up to where the women and children would live downstairs, and typically there'd be some kind of a loft or some, uh, like an upstairs room, if you will, and dad literally lived over the family. And so figuratively and literally, dad was over the family, and it was a, the, the structure set up in the home. And so you're going to see that, that what we read today would have been incredibly offensive to the men in the culture that, that were receiving this. Now, what you're going to find in addition is that uh, we're going to be offended in the opposite direction. And I'll show you in a minute what, what, that, what I mean by that. But um, in, in, in the context that, that he's writing to, women and children had no legal rights. They were property. And so what happened is if you had a loving and attentive husband and father, then that, that was a benefit to your home. But more times than not, you had a domineering and abusive a uh, uh, male figure in the home, and, and there was nothing that the wife and the, and the kids could do about it, right? You couldn't call the cops because the, the, the man of the household was the highest authority in that home and in that culture. And so, again, this message would have been incredibly offensive to the men who received it because it was very uncommon to address men at all in this culture when it came to corrective Issues. What you're also going to find is that this, this conversation today is not isolated to this passage. This is just one letter in the New Testament where we see talking about the parameters of marriage and family. Um, but you're going to find parallel passages in, in like the book of Ephesians um, and, and other passages in the New Testament uh, where, where it gives us a holistic concept of what we see as a pattern for relationships and family in the New Testament as Jesus' followers. And so let me give you the passage, and then we'll get into it, okay? Uh, this is going to be in Colossians uh, 3, verse 18, and it says this, Wives, submit to your husbands. Anybody got a rock? You ready to throw it yet? Okay. As is fitting in the Lord. That word right there causes a lot of problems, and, and this is where our culture currently would be highly offended by that word. In verse 19, husbands, love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. And the culture originally written, the original recipients of this letter would have been heavily offended by those instructions. Now, before we get into breaking down the text and just some practical application, um, I, I just want to deploy the airbag for a minute, okay? Like, before we get into it, uh, let me just tell you 10 things that this text is not saying, okay? So before you pick up rocks and you get ready to throw it, let me tell you 10 things it's not saying. Number one, uh, th this text is not talking to single people, okay? This is a very, very specific parameter, husbands and wives. It's not talking to sing single people. Number two, this is not talking to married people who are not Christians, not followers of Jesus, okay? This is very specific instructions for a Christian home of men and women. N number three, this is not speaking to any area or arena outside of the home. Okay, this is not about gender roles in culture and community. This is within the home and the family construct, okay? Number four, this does not say wives obey your husbands. This is really important because that, that's a lot of times what we hear when we, when we hear the word submit. I'm going to define it for you in a minute. But uh, this does not say obey. What you're actually going to see is uh, um, in the following weeks, he's going to talk about uh, children and parents and the relationship. And children are to obey their parents. But that's not what's being said here. It's really important to distinguish that. Number five, it does not say submit to your husbands even if it's sinful. Right? At the end of the day, both the husband and wife, they're going to be co-equal uh, um, in, in the sight of God and man. And so, so there's going to be this unique tension that they're both followers of Jesus and they're in a relationship together. But Jesus is still the ultimate authority. Right? So, so if my husband asked me, my husband, if my wife, I'm going to do it the other way. Okay. If I ask Danielle, there you go, that makes more sense. If I ask Danielle to lie for me or to steal for me. Or to or if I ask her to do something outside of the parameters that's honoring to God, right, she needs to say no. 
Because she answers to Jesus before she answers to me. Does that make sense? It's not saying that you should submit if it's sinful. Number six, it does not say that women are, are less valuable, they're less intelligent, less competent. And honestly, guys, can we just take a break and say, of course it's not saying that, because anyone in their right mind can look around a room of men and women and say, yep, there's definitely like an edge that the women have. Like, she's smarter, right? You get me and Danielle in the same room, and no one's like, hmm, you know what? Like, <laughs> it's just kind of apparent. Like, like, Danielle's a little more competent, okay? And, and here's the deal. It's, it's not like who's better or smarter, right? There are things that we're both good at and things that we are less inclined towards. The other day I walked in the room at one of our churches. I was showing a new family just some of the things that have been happening inside our building. And Danielle came up here and she painted a bunch of murals in our kids' rooms. And I was like, yeah, Danielle just got done painting that. And they were like, whoa, she painted that? And I was like, yeah, I genuinely don't know how in the world that she just free hands an amazing mural on a wall but it's way outside of my competence, competency and skill set. And uh, most people that you meet, if you sat down with Danielle, she'd say that, that they would say that they like her better than me anyway. And so I think this is a, a no-brainer. Number seven, it's not saying that uh, um, one or the other is superior. Or this is not a competition uh, um, meant to be domineering. Number eight, it does not say that a wife has no influence. That's, that's not what this means. It's not like the husband makes all the calls and the wife is to be quiet and sit down and just follow. It's not saying that. Um, number nine, this is not a personality type conversation. Like, like this is not saying that well, husbands need to be extroverts and, and, and wives need to be introverts and husbands need to be, you know, the, the, the primary extroverted loud leader and the wives need to be the silent follower. This is not about personality type. And number 10, uh, this has nothing to do with, with it being forced, okay? This is really, really important. This is a voluntary and relational situation. Voluntary meaning I, I, I'm going to make a decision to obey here because I love Jesus and I love the person in front of me. This is not a forced relationship, meaning husbands, you don't get to take this verse and look at your wife and says, the Bible says submit. That, my friend, deserves a rock thrown, okay? That makes sense. Like That's not the way you do it. Uh, um, and, and, and so in, in the same way, like, like, it's not, you need to love me and you need to submit. And, and, and if you don't, then I get to hold back. That's, that's not what this is about. This is a voluntary choice of love. It's not force. It's meant to be in the context of relationship. Now, let me give you a biblical paradigm of the home before I get into like some simple application of the text. And this is really important because th this is hard for the Western worldview to, to comprehend. Uh, but, but it's actually really healthy instruction if we put it in the right parameters. And so let me give you the biblical paradigm of the home and the family. Um, before I give you the husband and wife conversation, let me give you the, the God conversation, okay? And again, you might not be a follower of Jesus, and you might be looking at this, and you're like, man, this is why I'm not a follower of Jesus, because it's outdated, and, and it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't fit the current cultural context. Hang with me, and I promise you're going to find that this is helpful for you and for others. Now, um, the Bible... Uh, teaches this, this concept that, that scholars would call singular headship and plural leadership. It's big words, okay? Singular headship and plural leadership. And, and here's what that means. God, uh, the God, the God that we follow, is known as the triune God or the Trinity, meaning it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We have, we have God in three persons who are simultaneously one. And so what that means is that those three persons are completely equal. There's plural leadership between the Godhead, that there is Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and they, were, they are completely equal. At the same time, consistently we see in Scripture that Jesus submits to the Father, that the Father is over the Son. And so there's a singular headship in the Trinity. Does this make sense? I know this is a big concept, but I'm trying to help you understand that, that when God sets up the family dynamics and when he creates humanity, he's creating it in his own image. And part of that comes out of the singular headship and the plural leadership of the Trinity. And so let me give you two words so that we can define them, this submission and love. Let me, let me define submission for you for a second, okay? Okay. Submission is a voluntary willingness to recognize and put oneself under the leadership of another. The leadership, this is positional, okay? Now let me define love for you because this is really, really important. 
the, the word love that's used in this text for husbands loving their wives. This is the word agape that we see often um, in the New Testament. And this word describes the sacrificial, self-giving love whose model is Jesus himself. And so sometimes we, we read this text and we're like, oh man, husbands get it easy, right? Like women have to submit, but like husbands just have to love. No, no, no. Loving like this takes sacrifice. Loving like Jesus takes sacrifice. And by the way, one of the reasons we willing, willingly submit to Jesus <laughs> is because he's loving, right? You don't have a problem submitting to someone who has your best interest at heart. And so this is really, really important because these things play out hand in hand. Now let's go back to the text for a second. This all points back to Jesus. Wives submit, husbands love. This is all pointing to Jesus, that, that uh, um, Jesus was both our model and the one that we're putting our trust in. I want you to think about Jesus while he was here on earth. He was both under authority and in authority. And the same goes for all of us. No matter what role you find yourself in, we're all meant to be both under authority and in authority in different positions. We all have influence, but we're all under authority. This is the paradigm that, that the men would have been so, so offended by, is that there was no one that they were under authority over outside of like, you know, way out there context. But as far as their domain is concerned, they were, they were the head and the boss, and no one got to tell them what to do. But Jesus was both under and in authority. And so in the same way that the man is invited to be the head of his family, the leader of his family, but I want you to think about God inviting husbands to say, hey, this is my daughter who I love, who, I'm, who, who, who I created in my image, and I'm going to trust her to you. And, and I want you to think about your family as a garden, and you're the gardener. That's the responsibility here of, of, of submission, that, that, that he's going to lead his home to flourish and grow, that, that you're responsible for cultivating the lives to have healthy growth on top and deep roots on the bottom at a soul level, at a, an emotional level, at a mental level, at a physical level. This is an invitation to see the family flourish. Now, it does not mean that the man makes every decision. Again, singular headship, plural leadership. And so we do it together, but what it means is that, that the, the husband is going to take responsibility. And so I, I don't know if you've seen this play, uh, you know, dynamic play out. Mom makes a decision, and dad kind of half supports it or just silently goes with the flow. And then maybe it doesn't pan out the way it was supposed to, or maybe it kind of fell apart or you know, it blew up in your faces or whatever. And then dad says, well, you know, it's because we, we let mom make the decision. Right, that's unloving, and that's not taking ownership and leadership of your home. Right, but you go to your kids and say, hey, you know what? Me and mom made this decision together, and, and I'm going to do everything I can to, to, to see it work out a little better. Right, th th this, is, this is singular headship and plural leadership, that we do it together. And for Danielle and I, right, this is not about who's better or who's greater, but rather we are in this together, and I'm simply taking the responsibility of leading our home well. Now, I need you to understand that this word love, it's built in the context of friendship. That Jesus is not this high king up here only, separate from relationship. Part of his love for us is that he is also called our friend. That he walks with us as a friend. And so when, when, when the invitation is, is husbands love your wives, it's, it's be her friend. And wives be your husband's friend. That's the key to this entire conversation. I want you to think about it. This is not an invitation, wives, to, to let some random stranger make all the decisions for your life. Hey, why don't you just let this random person like, like, tell you what to do, where to go, and just pick it all for you. Right? Uh, no, I'm not, not doing that, some random stranger. But hey, how about your best friend who loves you, cares for you, has your best interest at heart, and, and is there for you and is going to support you through the entire thing? Would you let them make some decisions for you? Uh, you know, maybe that's a little different. Right? You see the difference? In the context of relationship, all of this makes sense. You remove relationship from this conversation. You remove friendship from this conversation, and it gets really scary really fast. It's really important that friendship stays at the center of this context. Now, I was reading a stat recently that said that one of the primary secrets to a happy marriage, if you will, is that you're consistently friends. It's a consistent answer. Hey, what, what, what's the secret to a long-lasting marriage? Hey, we're, we're friends. We do life together. Let, let me tell you about a few different types of marriage. Um, th th there's, 
different types that kind of play out, and, and you, there can be multiple ones in, in, in a single week even, but um, there's that shoulder-to-shoulder marriage relationship, and this is inevitable, right? This is just when, like, you're both grinding, and you, you know, whether you have kids or not, like, like you're just doing the work in front of you together because you're in it together, right? This is shoulder-to-shoulder work, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's inevitable, but, it's, but it shouldn't be the only kind of relationship that you have is, like, business partners in a home to pay your rent, okay? Then there's also a uh, back-to-back marriage, and this is when they're fighting. This is when they're dis- disagreeing. This is when, uh, you know what, we might pay, pay the bills together, but I'm going to lay in bed at night, and I'm going to lay on this side, you're going to lay on that side, and we're going to leave a little bit of room in the middle for the devil to sleep between us because we're angry with each other, right? That, that's back-to-back relationships, and it's unhealthy, and it's disruptive and it's unloving and it's disrespectful. And then there's face-to-face relationships. That's the the language of friendship, right? We we, we see often uh, Jesus talked about as a friend. We're we're told that we're going to see Jesus face-to-face one day in the context of friendship. We're told that when Moses walked with God, he he met with him as as someone face-to-face. It's in the context of friendship. And so there's this face-to-face conversation of, of not just doing life together and taking on responsibility together, but enjoying life together and living out life, and friendship together. And so here's why I say that. is because in the context of love and respect, in the context of relationships, um, th- th- there's issues, and then there's the friendship. And you need to decide, friends. I don't, I don't know where you are today as you're tuning in, whether you're single and, and you just have conflict with your friends or you're in, in a marriage and you have consistent conflict like, like Danielle and I do. We have to make a decision. Am I, I going to elevate the issue or the friendship? Which one's more important, right? Because if I invest and I cultivate the friendship, then it's going to be strong enough to handle the conflict. But if all I ever do is deal with the issues and I never cultivate the friendship, then then that relationship is going to crumble under the weight of that criticism. And again, you have to understand the men would have been furious to hear this. You're telling me I have to go downstairs and I have to love her? and care about what she cares about, and feel what she feels, and listen to her, and talk to her, and value my kids? That's kind of what you signed up for, bro, right? But this is a big deal. He's like, hey, you need to love your wife like Jesus loves you, sacrificially. And again, Jesus is our example here, friends, that he came to serve, not to be served. That he has our best interest at heart when he sacrifices for us. And, and you've seen this over and over again. What kills a friendship is selfishness. That, that, that when I only think about myself, the relationship diminishes. And so the invitation here for husbands is be a safe person and be a safe place for your wife and for your family to engage. Now, can I just tell you this? Marriage, <laughs> marriage takes a lot of faith. In this context, when he's speaking to followers of Jesus, marriage takes a lot of faith. You see, I can fight to protect myself, or, or I can simply trust in Jesus. I can fight because I feel the need to be in control, because when I'm in control, I'm safe. And, I, and this is whether you're husband or wife, different personalities have different approaches. Everybody's got their own fight, flight. There's all the, all the things, right, like that make a, a relationship unique. But I, I can trust Jesus to work in and through them and, and, and to work in and through me. Or I can hold on to control to keep myself safe. And again, we're not talking about genuine danger and abusive relationships. None none of that is on the table right now. We're talking about just the normal normal conflict in a home of two imperfect people being in a relationship for a consistent amount of time. And so let me say this last thing, that love and respect, um, man, they're communicated differently to different people. Right? Like the way that I feel respected and the way that you feel respected are probably different, right? The way, the way that I feel loved and the way that you feel loved, they're probably different. The way that Danielle feels loved and the way that I feel loved, they're probably different. And so if in my relationship all I do is love Danielle the way I would want to be loved, then she's probably going to feel unloved. And if in our relationship Danielle only respects me in the way that she wants to be respected, then I'm probably going to be, feel disrespected. Why? Why? Because we have different perceptions of what that feels like. So you know what you got to do? Ask. In your relationships, you know one of the fastest ways to reconciliation and feeling loved and, 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 and seeing respect grow a relationship? Hey, how can I be more loving? Hey, how can I be more respectful? And then shut up. <laughs> okay? Like no what ifs, no buts, no this or that. Just ask the question. 
and then be quiet and let them answer and then make the decision to love them where they are. Now, let me give you just a few tips on love and respect as we close out our time. And Daniel's going to be ready to come up here and uh, uh, um, then we're going to close out our time. But let me just give you a few tips on, on love and respect. Um, if you'll make the decision to make more deposits than withdrawals, you'll see that relationship grow. Right? That I'm going I'm to be more encouraging than I am critical. If you take some, t- take some time in your relationship and, and distinguish between sin and, and mistakes. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can treat a mistake l- like, like much bigger than it is. Mistakes are just that, right? They're just mistakes, and everybody makes them. There's a big difference between a mistake and a sin. And so if I'll make sure that I don't accidentally die on hills that I'm not trying to die on, that'll really, really help the relationship. It's important to remember that, that the relationship between a wife and a husband is, is covenantal, not contractual. Right? The employee relationship is contractual. But I don't treat my family like an employee. My, 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 my wife is not my employee. She's my friend. She's my wife. I can't fire her when I get mad at her. She can't fire me when she's mad at me. I can't show up with a list of to-do items because that was a part of her job description as my wife. No, we're friends. And we're committed to one another. Right? If all we do is engage in non-relational uh, um, activity, if, if all I do is, is work and then come home and get on my phone or watch TV or engage in my hobbies and we never connect face to face and we never enjoy the friendship, and it's going to deteriorate. If I never have any fun, listen, some, some of you guys just need to go have some fun. You're stressed and overworked and you're cheap and you don't go on date nights, you don't buy her flowers and, and, and just the little things, right? You can't afford flowers, go steal some of your neighbors out of their front yard, okay? Like, like it's just having a little bit of fun, investing in the relationship. And so in light of this crazy cycle, here's what I want to tell you. And here's what I have for myself, guys. Man, this, this is so heavy on my heart as I, as I want to love and, and lead my family well. I want to serve and invest in Danielle in a way that honors her and honors God. Your response is your responsibility. In the middle of conflict, your response is your responsibility. Here's what I mean by that. That your first calling, friends, no matter where you are on the relational journey, it's to Jesus, not your spouse. That you can choose to honor Jesus in the middle of conflict, even if they are not being honoring. That my response in the middle of conflict is my responsibility. I don't get to justify my unloving behavior if I feel disrespected. But rather, Jesus invites me to be loving even when I'm disrespected. And in the same way, I can choose to be respectful even if I feel unloved. Does this make sense? My response is my responsibility. So I have a couple of questions for you. Some action steps, some reflection steps. And I just want you to think about it on your own. How is it that you're going to prioritize getting alone in your God time this week? Because, guys, this love and this respect and this way of serving and loving others, man, this is so outside of the zone of what's natural and what's easy and what makes sense. There's a thousand books on a bunch of shelves at the bookstore that tell you the exact opposite. Pick up the rock. Throw it. Get them back. Don't let them talk to you that way or treat you like that. But what is the loving response? What is the thing that honors Jesus? Well, you're not going to know that outside of spending time with him. And you might ask the question, Drake, how is it possible? How do I not hit back? I mean, I mean, hurt people hurt people, right? So, so I, mean, I mean, why does it even make sense? Listen, Jesus does something that nothing else and no one else can do. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I need you to lean in and hear me when I say this. Jesus changes everything. And for you and me, man, if you're a follower of Jesus, you need, you need to be reminded of this, that you will never find the healing that your heart and your soul needs by trying to squeeze it out of somebody else. You're never going to find it in someone 
else. The love and respect wounds that you have in your heart and soul and the love and respect wounds that I have, they're only going to find healing in a relationship with Jesus, a continual, ongoing, daily relationship with Jesus. And here's why. I need you to hear this. Here is why this matters. Your value, your worthiness to be loved, to be respected, it has been spoken for. It has been given a magnitude of worth beyond comprehension because Jesus gave his life for you. That you are worthy of love. You are worthy of respect. Not because of your performance. Not because of your goodness. Not because you're so loving. Not because you're so respecting. But because God is so amazing. And he loves you. And you're made in this image. And he said you're valuable. And he proved it by giving his life in your place for your sins to save you and set you free. He did it for me. He'll do it for you. And this is incredible, guys. Here's why. Because when I'm met with that love and when I'm met with that worth, I'm also met with humility. That I'm reminded and I realize that I don't, I don't deserve that kind of love. I don't deserve that kind of respect. There's nothing in me that merits that. So then I respond in humility. And in that humility, I turn around and you say, you know what? You might not deserve love right now, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because this is what Jesus does for me. You know what? You might not deserve respect right now, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because that's what Jesus does for me. Guys, if there's anything good in you, and if there's anything good in me, it's because of the good God in you and the good God in me. And I hope that keeps us humble. And so our time with Jesus matters. Number two, man, can you just ask the question this week? to your significant other, to your spouse, if you're single, to, to your friends that you've been in conflict with, how can I be more loving or respectful? What do you need? Hey, how, how can I be more loving? How can I be more respectful? And number three, how is it that you can make more deposits than withdrawals this week in those relationships? How can you focus on, on the encouragement over the criticism? How can you make sure that the friendship is elevated over the issues? Take some time, invest in these things, and I promise you, you're going to find it's like pouring fresh water on some quenched flowers. And that garden is going to start to grow, and your marriage is going to start to grow. And guys, if you're single, let me encourage you with this. This is helpful, and these are principles that you can take and, and you can deposit into your soul today. But let me also encourage you. Are you the person that you're looking for is looking for? You see, you can make a list of all the things that you want in a significant other, but if you show up with a broken and hurt soul that Jesus hasn't already started to work in, then you're bringing some seriously damaged goods into a relationship with some other damaged goods, it's going to be complicated. And so are you the person that you're looking for is looking for? And lastly, let me say this. If you're not a follower of Jesus and you're engaging in this conversation, can I just encourage you, if you have never given your life to Jesus, if you've never taken a moment and stepped back and realized that he loves you, he gave his life for you, he rose again so that you could be made new, so that you could be forgiven, and so you could be a part of the family of God. Friends, I want you to know today, if you would choose to trust in Jesus with your heart and your mind, you could just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I want to give my life to you. I want to follow you. I need that forgiveness. Listen, none of us are perfect, and I don't think we have to make a pretty big case even to prove that. But the beautiful thing is Jesus said you're loved and worthy anyway. And the way to give that kind of love is first to receive it. Let me pray for you. God, thanks so much for our time. Thank you for your love for us. 
Thank you for demonstrating what it means to love sacrificially and to invest in others even when we don't want to and even when we don't feel like we have anything to give. Then when we press in close to you, would you fill us up with your love? Would you change our hearts and our minds? Would you allow us to be slow to speak and quick to listen and, and to be patient in our relationships? Would you help us to elevate friendship over issue? Would you help us to be loving and respectful as we listen and engage? Would you help us to ask those questions and have the boldness and humility to sit and listen rather than to rebuttal and respond. And God, would we see our marriages flourish? Would we see our families flourish like a garden with fresh water? Would you do something this week that breathes life into all of us? And for my friends who are on the outside looking in that haven't started a relationship with you, man, would you just do in their hearts right now what only you can do? Would you overwhelm them with your love? And would they say yes to you for the first time? It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching. We would love to connect with you and help you take next steps in whatever way is best. Just text that number on your screen, and our team will be sure and follow up with you.